I joined Facebook back in 2007 when I was a junior in high school. And back in those days, in kind of the early days of Facebook, I feel like the news feed looked a little different than it does today. Right? The things that grab your attention or, or hooked you in wasn't necessarily some political rant or a Facebook video or Facebook reel or a new story about some celebrity and some scandal that had gone on. But really, the Facebook news feed was filled with just what was going on in your friends' lives or in your friends' heads. They used to ask you, you know, what are you thinking? Which is kind of a dangerous question anyway. But there were three words that grabbed my attention when I scrolled through my news feed on Facebook back in those days. And those three words were, in a relationship. Now, depending on the context, you know, my response might differ, right? I might celebrate if it was a buddy of mine. It's like, yes, finally got the courage and asked her out. Or I might, you know, be shedding tears if it was the person that I was hoping I would be in a relationship with who'd gotten connected to somebody else. But I was always pining for those three words, right? To, to be on my Facebook page, to pop up on my news feed when I had entered into a relationship. Because especially as a junior in high school, I kind of thought that all the, the pinings and longings of my adolescent heart would be put at ease if I could just be in a relationship. But it wasn't all that uncommon, right? That after these three words showed up on a news feed, uh, two other words could follow, and that was this. It's complicated. <laughs> Whether you had the courage to actually post that or not on your, your Facebook page, it happened so often, right? Guys would get together with girls, girls get together with guys, and, and before long, it was complicated. Why? Well, I mean, we were in high school. There was a hundred reasons why it could be complicated, right? You know, maybe the, the, the boyfriend decided to hang out with the boys, you know, one night over the weekend, and, and the girl felt slighted. Like, how could you choose them over me? Then I was rocky. Or, or maybe boyfriend saw the girlfriend in the cafeteria talking to that guy, you know, the arch nemesis that she knew you could not stand. So I was like, what's going on here? This, this can't be right. Trouble in paradise. What, well, as it turned out, our hearts were just more complicated than we thought. Simply getting into a relationship wasn't enough to quell the turmoil. Well, whether or not we post it on our Facebook pages or not, whether we declare it on there, you and I, we're all in a relationship, right? Actually, we're in a whole web of relationships. If you think about your life, uh, there's a whole number of relationships that you're in. And I bet, as you looked at this list and considered your own life, the, the various relationships that you're engaged in, if I asked you how they were going, at least in one of these categories, you could probably honestly respond, it's complicated, right? It's complicated. Not because we're in high school and the reasons are still the same as to why our relationships are complicated, but because our hearts are still the same hearts that we had back in high school as young people. Our hearts are mixed bags of conflicting desires and emotions. There's longings that we have in these relationships, but we can't have it the ways that we want. For instance, uh, when it comes to my wife and I, if my wife and I are having an argument, which we never do, right? You know, some arbitrary argument. And later in the day, I come upon, you know, the facts that actually prove that my side in the argument was right. I want to go back and I want to rub Molly's nose in it. But I also want to sleep in a bed, you know, <laughs> you know, preferably inside of the house. And so I can't have both of those things, right? They're, they're in conflict. I, I, both of those things aren't going to work out for me. You know, maybe on the job site when you go to work, there's a day when the boss man comes in and, you know, he's just had it, right? You could tell he's, he's past his boundary and he's kind of steaming and so he lets loose on you and the other employees. You know, whether or not you deserved it. And there might be part of you that says, you know what, this ain't right. And he deserves 
to hear from us that this ain't right. And maybe you would even want to, to tell him off, to cut him down to size for once. But you also want a paycheck, right? So you hold that in. There's, there's conflicting desires, or maybe you don't, and maybe you find a paycheck somewhere else. But the reality is, our hearts are in conflict. How are we going to have a basis for navigating our relationships that are so often complicated? If our hearts are so tumultuous and in turmoil within us, how are we going to have a, a consistent way to go about the relationships in our life in a way that's actually going to lead to goodness in relationships? Well, here at St. Peter and Paul, we have a basis for this. It's our third core value, uh, summed up in two words, honor relationships. We acknowledge that our relationships are from God. God is our creating Father who desires a relationship with his creation, and he has placed us in relationships with others to reflect his desires to the world. This includes relationships with family, friends, people in the church, and those who are far away from Christ. Now, the key verse for us, again, that Luke 10, 27 passage, love God, love others. Honor relationships. This means to esteem others. Whatever relationship we're considering, we put the other person at a high value, higher than ourselves even. We say that they are precious in God's sight, and so they're precious in ours. They were made in the image of God, and so I'm going to treat them as one of God's creatures. I answer to him. This is the basis for us as we walk in relationship to others. And this is nothing new, the, the language that we've uh, given to this idea of honoring relationships for the church. Uh, this is something that Peter was instructing his churches, churches he was ministering to in. Uh, he acknowledged this web of relationships that we find ourselves in. He didn't reference the parent-child, but you can find instruction for those in Ephesians or Colossians. But Peter recognized that we live in relationships with people close to us, our siblings, or people far from us, the Gentiles, the brotherhood, the church. Peter would go on in chapter 3 to talk about the spousal relationship, husbands and wives, with his specific instructions for both. He recognized that there's a, a master-servant relationship. It doesn't resonate for us as much. We live in a different time and culture, but similar to employee, employer. And he also acknowledges that we live within a society. And we have a relationship to our government. And Peter, amidst all the instructions he gives to different categories of relationships, all of those instructions could really be fundamentally simplified to two words. We, we read it in verse 17. Honor everyone. Again, the word honor means to esteem, to lift up, to hold others as valuable in your sight. And that might seem simple. We have the command from Jesus, right? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and love others as yourself. But what I love about the scriptures is that they don't just give us a dictum and expect us to do it. The scriptures don't just give us a command and expect us to obey it like blind people following a word. If you do, it will go fairly well for you. But Peter and the scriptures also give us an account for why God gives us the command and also how we are to go about doing it. God doesn't just give us one more thing to do in our lives, but he actually gives us help in the solution. And so we'll look at what Peter says is the problem and what the solution is. Well, first let's look at the why. Why is there so much turbulence in our relationships? Peter puts it this way. There's a war going on. In verse 11, Peter says, abstain from the passions of the flesh because they are waging war against your soul. What Peter is saying is you are a mixed bag. 
you have desires within you that are counterintuitive to the things that you want. Now, sometimes when you hear passions in flesh uh, in the Bible, you're talking about very specific things like idolatry or sexual immorality or greed, things like that. But here in this section, the word that, that Peter uses for passions doesn't necessarily mean negative or disordered passions. They can even be good things. It could be the desire to have uh, words used of integrity to be spoken to you by your employer. That's not a bad thing to want. It could be the desire for uh, uh, you and your wife to have an agreement in your conversation, to come to some sort of resolve or resolution, even if that involves speaking a hard truth. That's not a bad thing. But the problem comes when the passions of the flesh take a higher precedent for us than what our soul is after. Or when we think those desires of our flesh, if those are just fulfilled, that our soul will be at ease. That's simply not the case. In our heart, there is a battlefield going on, a war that's being waged. And you sense it, you feel it, I'm sure you do. In these situations, in those complicated relationships, you likely sense the war waging within you. And when your wife asks you to do one more chore, and you start to think, don't I do enough? Are you ever satisfied with what I'm giving into this relationship? There's a war going on. When you feel a distance from your husband, a lack of connection with them, and you start to wonder to yourself, is there something flawed in me? Am I just at my core unlovable? There's a war going on inside of you. Kids, when your parents come up with a rule that they want to enforce in your home for stability, for good things to happen in your house, and immediately when they mention this new rule, you start thinking in your head how you are going to break it. There's a war going on inside of you. Because the reality is we are a mixed bag. There, there are two sides of us, right? We are made in the image of God. We've been endowed with His wisdom with the ability to reason and think and to see that which is good, we can hear the command of God that says, love him and love our neighbor and say that is good. But we also have the old Adam in us. We have that dark side to our nature. That side of Adam that says, God, I don't want to listen to your commands. I don't want to trust in your word. I would rather rebel. I think I can figure out my own way through this that's going to work better. Or perhaps the passions of our flesh, the desires that we have in our life are just so strong that all of that internal conversation is muted. We don't even hear this conversation. But we see ourselves speaking in harsh tones, justifying ourselves again, or harboring resentment and bitterness. How do we respond? What's the path forward? Well, I can tell you what Facebook will tell you. If you go on Facebook these days, and maybe even those days too, the world will tell you, you're right. Whatever you're thinking or feeling, whatever you feel you deserve, you're right, you do deserve that. And go out and take it for yourself. Don't let others stop you. Don't, don't let others get in the way. The world will take the issues of others and enhance them and overemphasize them so that you have a target to channel all of your frustration, that inner bitterness and resentment for those unfulfilled passions. But that's not the way you learned Christ. That's not the way God speaks to you. The world will say, if you, if you dislike the leader of your country, slander their name. Laugh at them, make jokes, criticize them, demean them. Don't honor them, dis 
honor them. That's not the way you learn Christ. The world will tell you if your spouse is upsetting you, troubling you, getting on your nerves. Well, forget them. Go out. Take, take some time for yourself. Do what you got to do to make yourself happy. Your happiness is more important than they are. That is not how you learned Christ. God answers differently. He says, honor everyone. Do good. Even to those who have unjustly wronged you. And that is so hard to swallow. And it's hard for me to not hear that and scoff. That's ridiculous. Says the old Adam in me. And this is why I'm so glad the scriptures give us more than just a dictum. Because if all I was given was, go and do this, I know that I would fail. But God gives us the how as well. How do we do this? Peter uh, puts it perfectly in chapter 4. He stays with the military languages of this battle going on, and he says, this is how you arm yourself. You look to Christ. Since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking. When you find yourself in these relationships filled with tension or bitterness or anger, this is how you put the stop, the pause, on your passions coming out of you. You look to Christ. You let him enter the battlefield of your heart. Because you trying to go up against your own passions, you'll never master them. They're too strong. It's like Helm's Deep and all the orcs coming and storming the gates. They got the big piece of timber and they're breaking down the door. All of the voices inside of you will rage and overcome and power your voice. But Jesus... Jesus went to the cross to dismantle those powers within you. Look to Jesus. Put yourself back into the gospel. For Jesus went to the cross, not just for all of the other people in the world who we want to look at and say that, that they have the problems, but he went there for you and me. Jesus went to the battlefield and he went up against our bitterness, our resentment. We were created to live in relationship. Jesus was spit upon. He still kept going to the cross for you and for me to take away our shame that we deserve, to take away the distance that we had earned for ourselves from God so that we could be loved and accepted and honored by God. Jesus suffered unjustly. He did good. He honored you. And he did it because he knew the Father's love. And Jesus knew what awaited him on that battlefield there at Golgotha. And he knew it would be difficult. He prayed to the Father, if it's your will, I'll go, but if you can take this cup away, please do so. But Jesus knew the Father's love for him. And that's what sustained him. That's what held him when he received the, the mocking and the cursing and the spitting and the frowning. How could Jesus not retaliate against them? The love of God suppressed those voices. His relationship with the Father strengthened him in his fight for us, for you and me. Augustine uh, put it this way in his confessions, a famous quote of his. He said, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Is it possible we're looking in our relationships for deep longings of our heart that cannot be satisfied by those relationships? Do we enter every political cycle with this idea that whoever's elected is going to be our savior if it's the right guy? Do we treat our spouses in our marriages with the idea that if they would just 
love us enough, then we would be complete and whole. Are we looking for a love from them that really belongs from God? You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Peter, in chapter 2, says, For this you've been called because Christ suffered for you, to leave you an example that you might follow in his steps. Know that you don't go alone. But Jesus goes with you. He is there with you in the battlefield of your heart. Turn to him. Turn to him like Gandalf there at Helm's Deep, right? Showing up in that burst of light. He's there. You're not alone. When you suffer unjustly in whatever relationship, Recall how Jesus has responded to you towards the Father. I want to take just a moment to look at one last slide. I want you to think about two relationships, or pick one or the other, in your life right now. What's not one new relationship that's been forming in your life, and what would it look like to reflect God's desires in that relationship? Or what's one difficult relationship that you're currently dealing with? And looking at the example of Jesus, how might you walk forward in it? Consider your relationships. Remember the God who has honored you always because of what Christ did for you on the battlefield of Golgotha. Now he goes with you in the battlefield of your heart. It's in his name we pray. Amen.